Sheriff Woody at your service. How old were you when you decided you wanted to work in video games? I was in uh, second grade, so I think that would make me. Are either of you guys in second grade? Um, I, 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 we're in primary school. Okay, so I think I'm I was like, grade. I think I was like six or seven when I knew I wanted to make games. Um, what was your favorite video game when you were growing up? Ah, my favorite video game when I was growing up uh, was Donkey Kong Jr. Well, that was one of them. Um, because it was, it emotionally really spoke to me because it was about, uh, it was, well, first of all, it was a sequel and it was about a little monkey going to save his dad. And I love that idea of like, um, you know, like it spoke to me, like going to go save my dad. So I related to it, but I also really liked, um, Secret of Monkey Island growing up. That was a big one for me. Obviously all the Super Mario games were, were a big deal too. Like Super Mario World was one of my favorites. I spent so long playing. But yeah, that's some of my favorite games growing up. Okay. Will Buzz Lightyear ever get his laser? <laughs> okay, so um, Ty, for you, I'll tell you that we are looking at all the different ways that we could upgrade the characters from 1.0 and like what is the exact right way to do that. Um, so some of us believe that you know we should just inherently upgrade the characters. Some of us believe that maybe we should release new versions of the characters later on. So we've been talking about that stuff back and forth. Um, but I think it's safe to say that one day you will see Buzz Lightyear with his laser and one day you will see Buzz Lightyear with full on flight. Um, I think that that makes a lot of sense and I think that fans really want to see that. So um, that'll be something real cool that we can do for our fans and for the community soon. This one you're going to keep on pointing at you until it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you get to fight a rifle? So you had asked me this question before and what was my answer? Yeah, <laughs> I said that, uh, yeah, you should play the game and find out. Is the toy box any bigger in 3.0? Like, in terms of how big you can make them? Yeah, because, like, in 2.0, you said, like, endless possibilities, you can build as far as you want. Right. But there was still that, you have to make your budget kind of thing, you still got right. that much. Yeah, well, so that's not something that we create. It's something that actually... The platform that you're playing on is, is part of the reason why it, the sizes are the way that they are. So let me explain it, it, it with a little bit more detail. So like your PlayStation 3, um, the amount of RAM that it has, like memory that it has, not like hard drive space, but like memory that the game can access to load things in and out of, that kind of stuff, um, it changed from PS3 to PS4, right? So you could actually, with PS4 and Xbox One, have larger toy boxes than you could with PS3 and Xbox 360. So it really kind of comes down to the amount of RAM that the actual game system you're playing on has. And then on top of that, it also has to do with how complicated the toys are that you're putting inside of your toy box. So if you put down a lot of toys that have AI, um, like artificial intelligence, that they do certain things and move certain ways, um, and even some of the toys that we have that are like the logic toys, like some of those can get and use a lot of the game system's memory, which is why they scale in, in certain ways. So you'll notice that when you put it down, if you take a look at the memory meter, how much that toy that you just put down used memory. So some of the most talented toy box artists, if you notice, they'll go and they'll take like one object and they'll constantly repeat that because that doesn't take up as much of the system's memory because of the way we architect the system we can duplicate things very very easily and that doesn't take a lot of RAM but bringing in lots of individual new items helps really balloon what that is so that's probably a little bit more depth than maybe you wanted but I wanted to kind of explain that's how it works and then the other thing that you have to remember is that with Disney ID we always wanted to make it so that like if your dad was playing on an iPad he could design it and then send it to you over Disney ID so you could load it up on your Xbox 360 or PlayStation 4, or Xbox One, whatever system it is that you have. So even when we do that, it becomes a little bit complicated because the amount of memory, system memory, that an iOS um, uh, device has, and there's so many different ones, right? You've got iPhones 4, iPhone 4, iPhone 5, iPhone 6, iPhone 6S, iPhone 5S, 
iPad, iPad Air, I mean all these different variants of that, they all have different memory footprints and so when you go and you design that toy box, depending on what device you've designed it on, when you send it to another device, sometimes that device might not have enough memory in order to load that thing. So most of the time, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, because they have the most memory, they can always create and load the largest toy boxes. But anyway, that's the way that it works and why it works that way. Trey, do you want to ask some questions? Do you want to read one? <laughs> yeah, don't mean to uh, talk your guys' ear off here. Making Disney Infinity. Oh, okay. So, what year did we start? Well, we started it working on Disney Infinity in late 2010. So, if you remember, the first version of the game came out in 2013. But when we started working on it, it wasn't called Disney Infinity. It was uh, originally supposed to be a game called. Uh, well, it was. It was a. The, the temporary name was Buzz Lightyear Star Command. And so the team was working on a sequel to the Toy Story 3 video game that they had made. I don't know if you guys ever played that. That's really great, though. Yeah. And so they were working on uh, Buzz Lightyear Star Command. And uh, well, that was the, the prototype name of it. And then eventually that became known as Project Toy Box because we redesigned it to be like, oh, we're going to have this one platform where we're going to have all these individual games, which is what the play sets became that all are connected by this central hub, which is what the toy box became. And, um, and so that's kind of where it started. And then eventually we uh, rebranded it and called it Disney Infinity. Um, but it's funny because all, not all of it, but a lot of the work that we had done on that Buzz Lightyear um, uh, Star Command prototype that eventually would become Disney Infinity, we actually reused for the Toy Story in Space playset. So it's fun because when I look at Toy Story in Space, I remember the way, way old prototypes that we had done for Disney Infinity of Buzz Lightyear Star Command, which had a lot of that content. Um, do you think Disney Infinity has helped to get more people interested into other Marvel and Disney stories? Yeah. Um, actually, so when we finish a game, we do what's called market research studies. So basically, our marketing team goes out and they ask people, they're like, hey, you know, what did you think of Disney Infinity? Did you know about these characters before um, you start playing Disney Infinity? Like, you know, all these different questions. And a bunch of the responses that we've gotten actually indicate that a whole bunch of Disney fans didn't know the Marvel uh, characters that well, and that Disney Infinity introduced them to these new Marvel characters. And at the same time, we brought a whole bunch of Marvel fans into the kids and family gaming space because most of the time Marvel makes core games. So we brought them into the kids and family space and then a lot of those Marvel fans got to meet these Disney characters and get to know Disney characters for the first time through Disney Infinity. So it becomes like this totally mutual beneficial, um, mutually beneficial um, uh, experience for Disney fans, Marvel fans, and hopefully this year Star Wars fans too. So like like kids for Disney there were no people like um, Woody and Buzz Lightyear and Jesse. Sure. And there were also no characters from Marvel that are basic like Spider Man so and then the elders were no people like Ant Man and people like that. So bringing all of them in a family size could make the Project Galaxy bigger. Yeah, no, absolutely. It does that, actually, right? Because I think this year, um, Ty, the, the Star Wars is a really great example of how it brings people together. Like, people make fun of me because I say, oh, uh, you know, it's a multi-generational brand. But what I mean by that is your dad grew up with Star Wars episodes 4, 5, and 6. That was his Star Wars, right? And you might have seen those, and maybe you haven't. But you guys grew up with episodes 1, 2, and 3, the Clone Wars animated series, and Star Wars Rebels, right? So that's the Star Wars you guys know. And what's fun about Star Wars, kind of going back to this whole, you know, dads like some of the older characters from Marvel versus kids are familiar with Spider-Man. With Star Wars, you've got dads and moms that are really familiar with the older Star Wars content. And then they say, you know, this is the Star Wars I grew up with. And they get to introduce it to you. And you guys get to play together. And then you go, well, wait, no, this is the Star Wars I grew up with. 
and you get to show the episodes one through three, Clone Wars and Rebels content. And it's fun because you guys end up sharing that together and those experiences together, and you create memories which brings you closer together as a family, we think. Like, moms and dads might know people like the Empire, right, Darth the, Yeah, Vader, Palpatine, right, Darth Palpatine, Vader. Palpatine, yeah. Yoda, mm -hmm. as kids might know people like Anakin, and Darth Maul, yeah, Ahsoka, Luke Ahsoka, yeah. as, and then elders, you know, like Palpatine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got it. You got it. You're totally right. Trey? I don't know who, is, who, who Ahsoka is, but I do know who Palpatine is. Yes. Well, has your dad introduced you to the uh, the older films? Yeah, yeah, I watched all of them. Too. Did you? Trey's only watched three. I mean, before we had started this little interview, I think we were talking about some of the games you guys are playing. I think your dad introduces you to uh, to games like Call of Duty and uh, <laughs> and others a little bit earlier than most kids do, right? You can what level did you say you were? Hitman. What level were you in Call of Duty right now? Really hot. <laughs> it's so hot like that I call you from one. You're going to have to edit that bit. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. Dad likes to keep you guys, you know, and that's okay because as a parent you can do that, right? Um, he likes to keep you guys uh, educated on all different types of content, right? Okay, Trey, do you want a question? Read. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite Disney movie? Mm. What is my favorite Disney movie? There's a lot of them. Um, so I'll give you the one that just popped right into my mind because uh, it's the one I just watched most recently. Toy Story. No. Well, Toy Story's really great, right? Um, Toy Story's really, really great. Um, Inside Out, I think, is fantastic. Um, I think that, uh, um, like, from a classic perspective, though, I really enjoyed Fantasia. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was a really magical kind of... Uh, crazy film um, and anything Chippendale growing up I used to love. I love watching Fantasia and my school even did a show about Fantasia yeah. when I was little. Yeah. yeah. And you were the conductor. Awesome. Yeah. It was a little bit funny and silly and a mix of it as well. Trey, what's your favourite Disney movie? Um, I don't know. Um, Toy Story 3. Yeah. Did you guys cry in Toy Story 3? No, I mean, um, I was too, like, young to understand what, like, a death and, like, leaving your family meant. Yeah. But now I'm all, more older, like... <laughs> <laughs> now, now you get the tears? Yeah, like, like, when, when I was at school, when we had to, like, have a five-minute silence mm -hmm. to pay our respects to the soldiers. Yeah. If I was way more younger, I'd be like, oh, that's really funny. But now, I was like, okay, what do I say? But then at the end, when he said, it, okay, stop, I was like, okay, thank God, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, right? So it's, um, it's funny, too, because as you grow up, when you give your toys away for the first time, or you have to put them away, that becomes, I mean, you remember that experience. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually why I still have my first stuffed animal I ever had. His name is Pluffy. He's a little white bear. I still have him. He's the best. I'm very cute. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I have a white bear. He's called Mr. Stife. What's his name? Mr. Stife. Mr. Stife? Yeah. I like that. I, I still have lots of teddy bears. Do you? Mm. Okay. What is your favorite Marvel movie? Oof, my favorite Marvel movie. Well, I have not had a chance to see Ant-Man yet, but I hear it's fantastic. So Ant-Man, I'm sure, would be one. But right now, it's got to be... Um, this is really going to sound silly. Yeah. I love the original Blade. Have you seen that? Blade. Um, no, that happened. He's the vampire hunter. Yeah, right? I think Blade is awesome. Yeah, he's the vampire hunter. Guy. I haven't seen it. I yeah, think, Wesley I've Snipes, Blade, seen. Blade. Yeah, it was really cool. I've seen ant -Man. And did you like it? Mm -hmm. That's great. I hear it's really funny. And I hear that the actor that played Ant-Man, Paul Rudd, did a really great job. Okay. If you had to choose, what are your two favorite play sets from 1.0 and 2.0? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, okay, from 1.0, I think my favorite play set, it's, it's not fair because when you ask me this question, if any of my friends that I work with mm -hmm. see this, they're going to get mad no matter what I choose. Um, so they all have different qualities, but if there is one right now where you're like, hey, let's, Johnny V, let's go play a playset together, which one do you want to play? I would probably say we should go check out Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, 
I really like that one. I love everything that um, Studio Gobo had done with Avalanche to make like all the different waves animate and all the ship to ship combat. I thought that was a lot of fun. So that would be from 1.0. Uh, and then from 2.0, um, Spider-Man was a lot of fun because of the web um, uh, swinging, but I thought that if I could play another one again right now, it'd probably be Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, yeah. And the reason why I liked Guardians of the Galaxy is because that one ended up being a little bit more linear in nature, meaning like you really kind of went from point A to point B to point C to point D, like you really kind of went down a set path. And um, Spider-Man and Avengers were both great play sets, but they were so open that um, I felt like the linear, the more linear structure of Guardians um, was was more for me. So those so those are my. Do you think you might get lost in the other world? No, it's not that I get lost. It's that uh, I like experiencing the story, and then when I'm done with the story, going back and collecting. Um, it's kind of like you know when we were talking about playing Infamous, right? Um, there are so many times in, in open world games where even I get distracted about what I'm supposed to be doing and where I'm supposed to be going. Um, and it's okay to do that, um, but it was fun because we hadn't done that before in Infinity. If you remember, all the Infinity One play sets were open world, so you could go anywhere and do anything. So it was interesting to have a place that where we had more of a, a linear structure. And Inside Out is actually a lot like that for Infinity 3.0 this year. And I'll, I'll be curious to see what people think. Yeah, like games like Batman, you would have this like bunch of Riddler trophies. Right. But it would be such an open world, you might get bored very quickly. Right. But when, if the Riddler trophies were in this one linear place, that right. would really make sense. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Trey, do you want to ask a question? Last, nearly finished. Last, it's the last one. <clears throat> what is the biggest thing that has changed between 2.0 and 3.0? Um, I think one of the most significant things that we've done is put a lot of emphasis this year, or a lot more emphasis this year, on um, the toy box games. Um, so people kept on saying that they want more playsets. So we've actually added a lot more playsets. So with the first version, you know that we had um, six playsets. And with the second version, we had three playsets. And with this one so far, we've announced five playsets and there's more coming. Um, but that was one thing I think it's, it's really different is like we, we've done a lot more playsets but I guess where I was going with that is that the fans had asked us to have content that all characters could play in and we always had the toy box mode but these toy box expansion games that we're introducing this year are structured gameplay modes that any character can play in and we're putting, we did it, we did it a little bit last year with um, the assault on Asgard and Escape the Kiln um, but this year with the kart racer and with um, the toy box uh, takeover, the, the villains takeover mode. I think that people are, are, are hopefully going to really like those and like the fact that they can use all of their characters inside these modes. And I could see that actually being really, really popular with, um, with kids and family. I don't think we'll ever get rid of play sets. I mean, we'll always do play sets. People will always want to have that experience of going and, and seeing the film and then playing a story either derived or inspired by the film. But um, the expansion games are a great opportunity for us to allow the big mashup. Yeah. Uh, this is the question that just came to the top of my head. Sure. Which is, um, like in 2.0, um, the Spider Mans and Guards of the Galaxy, those two final boss battles were a little bit disappointing. Okay. Like, Bowden was just put a ball into the shield, the shield disappears, it's done. Mm -hmm. And Spider Man, which was all like. Um, just like you know, I just it, it's an auto drive bike, and all you have to do is like dodge. You can move a bit mm -hmm. so that you can dodge, and all you have to do is like shoot and dodge, and that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But then when it was, but then Avengers, it was really good because it was this big giant frost giant. Yeah, the frost and, beast. And you had to like fight him. It was a challenge, and yeah. that's why I like that. But then Spider-Man and Guardians, it wasn't a challenge, so it was kind of a disappointment. We improve it and 3.0. Yeah, absolutely. But um, what I'll do is I want to take that feedback back to the team, and we'll have that conversation. Um, and, and definitely there are improved boss battles in um, 3.0. I think that um, uh, some of the demos that we have, people have had a chance to play the General Grievous boss battle, which is fun. It's a multi-stage boss battle, uh, a little bit like the how the Frost Beast was. There's also uh, a great battle with Darth Maul and, of course, the one with uh, Vader. So I think that players are really going to enjoy some of the boss battles that we've put inside of 3.0. What's difficult, Ty, for us is that when we designed them, 
not every player is as sophisticated as you guys are at playing games. Um, so we have to make sure that we design them in such a way that even though you might have thought it was a bit anticlimactic, you may have had friends that aren't as good at video games as you that still feel accomplished by winning. And so we have to do this kind of balancing act where it's like we have to make it accessible so that anyone could really beat it, but at the same time also challenging. So I'm sorry if it was disappointing, and we'll definitely try harder next time. That game's like Dark Souls, not everyone's new because it's constant torture. Yeah, Dark Souls is constant torture. Yeah. yeah. That's a tough one. When I played Bloodborne, I spent ages, about an hour, getting past the first bit of the game. Yes, that's so did how, I. That's how much I'm bad. And then there's the boss battle, kills me in one hit, and it goes, time to go from the start. I rage quit. Did you? <laughs> I uh, When I was playing Bloodborne, I didn't realize that you're supposed to die on that first fight. And then it respawns you in that graveyard, and then you're supposed to pick up a weapon, and then you're supposed to go and fight the werewolf. Like, so I was right because it's like, what game are you supposed to die? Right? <laughs> and then so I got a little bit confused myself. Um, I actually had to. I, I was complaining to a friend about it that I'd spent like an hour, just kept on going back to that werewolf to try to beat the werewolf with my bare hands. And then they're like, no, you dummy, you're supposed to die. And then in that graveyard is a hatchet that you pick up. And then you go back to fight. I'm like, well, what game has you die on purpose? Exactly. <laughs> don't get it. They could have a little objective markers like, die. <laughs> yeah, or, or instructions. But whoever reads those, right? <laughs> like, I won't play it because of, like, the... I won't play it because of the puzzles, though. I'm not going to play it ever because of the name and the sense of hope. Mm, okay, well that's good yeah, to know. You're a bit little for the horror, aren't you? Yeah, so. you're, you're a little, yeah, definitely definitely too little, but you can play Disney Infinity, that'll be fun. Little, he does. <laughs> you're a little bit too little for horror, but then there's me like Asian Isolation, which makes me poop myself. <laughs> well, I'm when, a little bit into Dying Light. Yeah, um, when, when I first played Asian Isolation, when I was playing it, he was evil. So he did. Turn off the lights. And I had it at night time. I didn't get nightmares, luckily. Mm -hmm. I played it at night time because that was when Dad gave it to me. Yeah. I, and it was on his desk, so I. So now that I think about it, I think he was planning something. And then when I play it at night, I'm, I'm actually pooping myself in the first, just the first cutscene. Um, is the alien gonna pop out right. and and scare me? And then every hour and then. Dad would just uh, uh, behind my back. <laughs> Take it, you dog. So, oh, mean so dad. I had to like leave one ear open. I yeah. My headphones, so it would make the game harder because I could only hear my right ear. Yeah. Open, but then I had to hear Dad to check if he's gonna go behind me. So it was all big of, should I be worried about the alien? Oh, That's okay. crazy. Right, you're going to say thank you to JV for giving you your time? Yeah, thanks guys. Sorry I have a 10 o'clock meeting, but it was really, really nice meeting you guys. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being fans and thanks for coming. Okay. Bye. Bye.